Good morning and welcome to another edition of United Way for Southeastern Michigan's What's the Word Wednesdays. My name is Audrey Walker and today we are going to be talking about youth and the disability justice movement. This is the second town hall in the series of uh, What's the Word Wednesday events focused on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It aligns with United Way's 21-day equity challenge, which began May 20th and is continuing through June 17th. We'll share more details about the equity challenge and how you can get involved at the end of uh, today's series. For now though, let's turn our attention to the disability justice movement. And as a reminder, we'll reserve the last 10 minutes um, of today's discussion for questions at the end. So please put your questions in the chat box if you're watching on Zoom or in the comments section if you're watching on Facebook. Um, I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Rami Alvarez, a community organizer at Detroit Disability Power, um, is going to speak today about their work with youth at DDP, as well as the intersections of disability and identity in the disability justice movement. They will also share ways that youth and others can get involved in disability rights and, and justice. A uh, little bit about Rami. Rami Alvarez is an aspiring public speaker, artist, and healer from Durango, Mexico, currently living in Southwest Detroit. With dance, humor, history, and the power of group dialogue as their tools, Rami hopes to be of service to the communities that helped him grow and change. Uh, Rami imagines a world where movements are more connected, a world where environmental issues, HIV, AIDS, stigma, disability, and racism are not seen as separate systems of injustice, but as one interwoven crisis of inaccessibility and violence. Rami strives to center youth voices, empower at every chance they get, believing firmly that intergenerational movements are the most liberating and sustainable. And to unwind, Rami watches Sailor Moon reruns, I love Sailor Moon, bakes almond cakes, which sound delicious, intense to their indoor and outdoor garden, which I hope is thriving right now. Maybe you have strawberries, maybe you don't. I know we do. <laughs> but Rami, I just want to thank you for joining us today. We're excited to hear more about your work at Detroit Disability Power and have a discussion about disability justice. So thank you so much for joining us. This is Rami. Uh, thank you so much, Audrey. That was amazing. That was <laughs> such a great intro. Uh, it felt so official the way you just cut into that. Uh, so thank you, and um, I might need to abbreviate my intro. I've never heard it read out loud to me, and I was like, wow, that's a doozy. All good uh, things. Yeah, awesome, yeah. Uh, so uh, hello, everyone. Um, like Audrey said, my name is Rami Alvarez, and I'm the community organizer for Detroit Disability Power. I use uh, he, him, his, and they, them, their pronouns. Uh, also, like it was said, I'm originally from Durango, Mexico, but as a child, uh, I moved to Detroit with my parents from Mexico. Uh, I'm a light brown skin person with facial hair, glasses, and short black hair. I have a tan cap on and small silver hoop earrings. Uh, that last part of my introduction there is something we call a visual self-description. And it's a habit and best practice to do this in disability justice spaces or in like accessible spaces. Um, visual descriptions uh, help our low vision or blind friends or folks get a sense of who is in the room in the same way that I as a seeing person does. So for example, like I said, I'm a seeing person. If uh, when I look around a room or a Zoom room, um, just from what I see, I can get a good estimate of like the age of my audience, of whether there are more like people who present as women or men in the room, which is an assumption, but it's still some visual information. Um, I can see whether there are more people of color or more white people in an audience or in a room. Uh, and because we do live in an ableist world, uh, the needs of blind people, for example, are not regularly considered. Um, so some of us might not have never thought about the utility of a visual description, but to our blind community members, uh, they're essential to participate. Um, and adopting new and accessible uh, practices might take work, but uh, COVID has proved that they are possible. Uh, just look at the rapid pace at which we developed work from home infrastructure uh, when 
the problem affected all of us and not just a marginalized group uh, and how quickly we developed um, what in essence were access practices. We might not have called them that, we might have called them you know, temporary COVID mitigations, um, but people with disabilities have for a long, long time been asking uh, to participate in the work culture by having work from home um, options, uh, sick leave that was, you know, um, equitable uh, to someone's life and the amount of PTO that they might need, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that, that's a little bit of a tangent. Uh, there, back to like just accessible practices, there are uh, more and more such practices like the visual uh, self description that, that, that I just gave there. Uh, and these, be these best practices uh, make room for uh, our deaf community members, hard of hearing community members, people with intellectual disabilities, people with disabilities that affect their uh, ability to move, which might not be super prevalent on Zoom, but might be more uh, prevalent in like a physical space. Uh, so I hope that that just quick meta comment about what I did there gives you a glance into accessible meeting habits um, that inspire you to connect with either us at Detroit Disability Power or any other disability resource to understand how you can make um, the place that you work uh, develop some routines uh, to have in your back pocket in the event that somebody joins your team or somebody comes to a meeting that does have an access need that you need to meet. Um, so yeah, if you want to connect with us, you can always check out DetroitDisabilityPower.org and um, sign up for our monthly email or just peruse our website. We try to keep it pretty up to date um, and uh, you'll find some, some info there. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna take a sip of water because I am chatting a lot today. Um, and I guess continue the sort of meta commentary by saying that like um, in that quick intro there, I used two words that I want to define and not assume that folks here just know the definition of. And uh, that would be the word ableism and the word disability. Uh, for ableism, I know that I'm that like folks can't come off mute and, and share, but in the chat, um, can folks give me some like one word definitions or reactions to what they think ableism means or what they know ableism means? Um, you can also give give it a shot at defining ableism. I, I, I wanna know what folks, uh, how folks relate to that word. I will give that a second. I'm not seeing anything so far, but I did see a comment that said that was a wonderful and helpful tangent. So keep going. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is Rami. I see that we have from Liz, ability from Aaron, uh, assuming that people have ability or making that the default. Ableism to me is the assumption of a normal experience of being in your body. Yeah, so, uh, oh, another one. Shayla says, our world is structured around abled bodies, is not made for us uh, with disabilities. Yeah, so you all are right in the ballpark of what ableism means. Ableism is much like sexism or racism. It's the structural um, discrimination, uh, disadvantaging, divestment um, of communities of people with Dis disabilities or individuals with people with dis disabilities. Um, and uh, it's the discrimination of people with dis disabilities based off of their disability. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that we understand that because it it is, um, as, as someone who's like in the, in the work, I feel like a fish in water sometimes. So I assume that folks just know what these words mean, but in reality, like I think disability justice is pretty new to the greater conversation. Uh, of justice in, in uh, the US. And I think COVID is a big part of why that is. Um, and then the other word um, is disability. I think we should take a crack at defining that. Um, and uh, this one's a bit trickier because there are two sources, uh, two popular sources from which this word is defined. One is the medical world, uh, which is the one most of us are familiar with. Uh, we call that the medical model of disability. And in that model, 
disability is a problem to be cured. Uh, it's seen as a diagnosis, not as an identity. And it's framed as a barrier to a higher quality of, of life. Um, it's not a definition that comes out of the disability community, out of actual disabled people, but a definition that came on to disabled people uh, from, from the medical space. Uh, on the flip side of that coin, uh, we have the social model of disability. It's not the opposite of the medical model. Um, it's just an addition to it. Both definitions are really relevant to the work of disability justice um, and play a part in the conversation. We can't ignore the medical model's um, influence on disability, but it's not the end all be all. The social model of disability defines disability as a natural occurrence and an integral part of human bodily diversity. Mouthful, I know, I'll say that one more time. In the social model, we see disability as a natural occurrence. So not one to be corrected, not one to be uh, eugenics around, not one um, to be uh, you know, organized around preventing in, in, in any way. It is just a natural occurrence, whether it is a child born with a disability or whether you become disabled as a result of aging, as a result of an accident. Like these are, these are things that we, can, we will never be able to phase out fully. Uh, and we also see it as an integral part of human bodily diversity. So in disability justice, we admit and understand that bodies are different and diverse. And part of that is the way that disability comes in and expresses itself. Um, so in the social model, disability is not the problem. The, ex the inaccessible world we built is the problem. The set of choices that we made to build a world that was inaccessible is the problem, not the disabled individual themselves. Therefore, in disability justice, disability is not a negative word. Um, and it's a word that folks can take on as an identity of pride. It's also a much broader definition Whereas the medical model is focused on a certain diagnosis, uh, the social model includes a much broader definition and, inclu and it includes mental health uh, issues such as anxiety, depression, or PTSD. It also includes cognitive disabilities like ADD or ADHD and chronic illnesses like diabetes, cancer, HIV, AIDS. So it's a much wider umbrella. And in fact, you might find that during this chat within the disability justice movement's definition of disability, you might be disabled. Uh, it's a journey uh, and it's not an easy word to take on. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, so by no means am I prescribing disability onto anyone, um, especially difficult for, it's, a, it's an especially difficult word to wrangle with for people who have invisible disabilities. Um, disabilities that cannot be seen immediately. So um, that's also something we can process more if you connect with TTP at a later time. Um, at this point, uh, I'm done with sort of like what I wanted to like give you all as food for thought to walk away with in terms of disability. But there are some reflection questions that we can blend into the Q&A time for me as, as well. Uh, questions that I have for you all um, that you don't necessarily have to answer today but are questions that maybe will help you unpack disability in your own life. But I'll let Audrey, you let me know like where we are on time and if I should maybe ask one of my questions first for the audience or if we should move on to Q&A. Yeah, thanks uh, Rami, this is Audrey. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for diving into that and giving us those definitions. It's very helpful. And if you want to start with one of your questions, we can maybe get some responses in, in the chat or have people reflect on it. And then um, I'll ask you a question. Great. Yes. Awesome. So I want to quickly connect um, the experience of youth and disabled people uh, really quickly um, before getting to one of my questions. Um, so I, I used to be a youth organizer for about four years before I was before I moved into the disability justice space. And during my youth organizing, I worked with a lot of uh, students with IEPs, which are also known as like special needs, um, might be a more colloquial way of, of, of saying that. But um, yeah, 
So um, really the thing that connects uh, youth of all kinds, disabled and non-disabled, and disabled people of all ages, not just youth, uh, is a matter of agency, uh, of control over what happens to their bodies and their lives. Um, the minds of disabled people and youth are condescended to and minimized, and both youth and disabled people exist in systems that do not prioritize them, um, making the failures of those systems very obvious to them. So in my experiences as a disability and youth organizer, I found that the sharpest and most profound analyses of our societies, and, and therefore the, like, so, the solutions to those problems, have been in spaces led by disabled youth, by youth who are both um, young and in that period of their lives where they are uh, getting keen to what it means to be an adult in all the ways that's <laughs> set up to fail. Uh, and also youth who are disabled, uh, who are uh, already struggling to have an accessible time, usually in their middle and high schools, and already have a really keen sense of like difference, of second-class citizen treatment, uh, of unfairness, of othering, of being a pariah. And um, unfortunately, you know, that results mostly in having a really crappy time in high school, but it also, uh, uh, you know, with the right mentorship and support from an adult, uh, which is what we do as, as youth organizers, it helps them develop an analysis of the world based on their own uh, ex experience here. So uh, in efforts to make the world a better place for disabled youth, I have some questions that Help, um, help us unpack where our beliefs about disabled youth come from in our experiences. And usually they're from our families. So one thing that I want you to think about and journal about or process about with a friend is do you know, um, and this is sort of like a scaffolding of questions. Do you know people in your life who have prayed or wished for a normal, quote unquote, normal baby during pregnancy. What does normal mean in this case for you? Have you ever heard of a disabled child being referred to as a test from faith or as a punishment for sin or as a result of karma? And these questions um, have a religious tone to them on purpose because I wrote them. And uh, I, am, I am open about my experience being raised Catholic, like that's not a problem for, for me, but it's usually uh, the religious backdrop that we have growing up, if we have any at all, that informs the way uh, our families talk about disabled youth, uh, the prospects of a disabled baby, what a normal uh, baby or child looks like. Uh, and um, the reason we have these thoughts is it because we're cruel? Uh, it's because we plainly see how hard it is to carry a marginalized identity. Um, and it's not uh, a task that anyone will willingly take on. And that, res that resonates in many, com in many spaces. Um, I'm also uh, a queer man. So um, it's keen on me that like um, my queer identity is a source of pride, but it is also something that's plainly hard to carry. Um, it also comes with its its own ch challenges there. So not trying to minimize, you know, the, the difficulty of living with a marginalized identity, but those questions, um, journaling to them, thinking about them, thinking about our earliest memories, um, meeting a disabled person, or maybe it was a disabled relative, and how the family discussed disability is a really good place to start unpacking our own ableism. Um, so I'll post those questions in the chat, if I can, is that possible? Um, yeah, I think it. you should be able to. And I see that there is already some chat, some questions in the chat. Um, if we would like to move on to one of those, I don't need people to answer these questions per se, like they're sure. kind of loaded, <laughs> um, <laughs> but they're helpful. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, well, I know you you give us um, a chance to explore the definitions around disability and ableism, and I wonder, since we're talking about disability justice, if you can explain a little bit more about what disability justice is and yeah. why does it matter? Yeah, so I think disability justice is important for two reasons. 
One, it is um, living and breathing inter intersectionality in a way that I think other justice movements can model. Uh, and two, it is fundamentally changing the way we do social movements. So um, starting with the first point, um, what disabled people need is such a layering of like pu of public services and also like cultural um, things to shift. Um, so for ex example, um, in, as, as an organizer, when I have a one-on-one -on -one with a disabled resident in Metro Detroit, um, they bring up issues of employment, of transit, of, of healthcare, of housing, of voting rights access, all in what they're describing to me as an obstacle. And I'm like, oh my God, like your, your experiences um, are actually like interweaving themselves and pointing us to a direction of like, you know, a, a more root cause issue. Um, because you're having a hard time finding employment, um, there's like a thread there, right, of, of, of issues. And then because they're having a hard time with accessible transit, there's like a thread of issues there. And because their building, you know, doesn't, isn't accessible to them, there's a thread of housing issues there. So um, whenever disabled people organize, it's always usually from a very like multi-issue stance, very, um, very, very few times is it like a siloed one-off issue. Um, and I think the reason for that is because disabled people exist in every other marginalized group. Like there are black disabled people, disabled women, there are queer disabled people, there are poor disabled people, uh, there are disabled people internationally, you know, having a shared um, ex ex experience with their governments and with their built worlds. Um, so that experience means that the disability justice movement, like at the start and at its core cannot be um, single issue, uh, cannot, it loses a lot by not incorporating as many identities at, at, at the table as possible because disabled people are, like I said, they exist across every other group, privileged and non-privileged. Non um, and, and therefore our collective power has like a really interesting insight. Um, and what I say about uh, the last point, and I'll be quick about it, when I say like that disability justice movement is changing the way we do movements, period. Um, <clears throat> social justice movements from the United Farm, Farm Workers Movement to the Civil Rights Movement, uh, they led to a lot of burnout. They were, um, they had uh, like cultures of like, martyrdom like work very hard and at your expense because there's like a greater cause and we disabled people are saying like we literally can't do that <laughs> like we literally can't maintain that pace and expect change to come we're coming out resentful of our own movements at the end of this because of how much they took from our own lives so our movements have to be more patient and more sustainable and disabled people are living that in a way that i think is easy to model um, and for other folks to look at. Um, so I, I think that's why um, disability justice has uh, flourished so much. And maybe from your point of view, you haven't noticed the flourish, but for those of us that are in it, like more politicians are openly talking about disability and disabled folks as like a constituents, which is like really significant for us. Um, and that is a result of definitely COVID, you know, um, and all the expertise that came out of the disability justice movement that like, oh, we've been doing that, you know, like we've been meeting on Zoom before, we've been um, advocating for uh, better access uh, and cheaper access to healthcare. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more I can say on that um, because I'm, you know, biased, but those are just some reasons. Uh, and passionate think. about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and knowledgeable about it and all the things because we do Really appreciate everything you've been able to share with us today. I have one more question. How can people watching today get involved with Detroit um, Disability Power? Yeah, so uh, two main ways. One, I want you to check out our event on Tuesday, June 14th uh, at 6 to 7.30 p.m. called Queer Pride and Disability. It's our event that we're hosting in honor of Pride. It's a panel um, and uh, July is uh, Disability Pride Month. So June and July, really, really busy for us. Um, but if you wanna 
um, stick around a little longer, I would recommend becoming a member of Detroit Disability Power. So at DetroitDisabilityPower.org slash membership, uh, you'll find the member form and membership is, um, you could pay into it. You do not have to pay into it. There, there's uh, an economic uh, like waiver there for an, an, anyone that doesn't wanna pay. Um, nothing official, you just let us know. Um, but we don't want money to be a barrier to becoming a member. But by becoming a member, you add your name to a list of so far 250 Metro Detroiters um, that sort of like back DDP so that when we go into conversations with elected officials, we're able to say, it's not just, you know, those of us that work at this nonprofit that believe this, but a membership that, you know, supports and believes in the, in the things that we support. And yeah, so check out membership. Um, you can feel free to get to know me better by emailing me and I'll drop my email in the chat before you become a member. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's great that you can get involved. Thank you so much, Rami. This is all the time we have today, unfortunately, because I know we've learned so much from you um, and appreciate you being here with us today. Um, and we appreciate all the work that Detroit Disability Power does in our community. So thank you so much. And we have a few more updates to share with everyone before we close out today's event. Um, as a reminder, for anyone in the community that may be experiencing a need, our 2 on one helpline remains available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we maintain a running list of available services in the community that can connect you to the support you need. And you can also look up those resources in your area by using the 2 on one resource database at unitedwaysem.org slash 2 on one um, also want to give you an update about the equity challenge 21 day equity challenge is happening right now. Um, it's an annual event featuring daily emails and weekly discussions aimed at deepening our understanding of ourselves, our community and the inequities that we face, and you're still able to sign up for the remaining emails and catch up on previous topics like resilience and healing, racial disparities in healthcare, and more. We'll also be hosting our community celebration event to close out the Equity Challenge on June 17th, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. So you can learn more and sign up online at unitedwaysem.org slash equity challenge. And finally, our next town hall will be on June 15th, and it will focus on housing rights and justice, featuring speakers from Hope, Pontiac, and Michigan Coalition Against Homelessness. To see our previous town halls and sign up for email updates on upcoming town halls, please visit unitedwaysem.org slash virtual town halls. And the website is also included in the chat box. So um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Thanks again, Rami, for joining us. And we will see you soon and we hope you stay safe and continue to live united.